So anyways, here to talk to us about um, the history of games um, and in some ways his career. Uh, let, let me say it the other way. Uh, his career in games, which in many ways is uh, a story of the history of games this past 30 years, is Matt Forbeck, who has been, you know, working in tabletop um, gaming since the 1990s. And Matt's work has been super duper influential. He's done everything. He's written supplements for Dungeons and Dragons. He has edited supplements for Dungeons and Dragons. He's put out role playing games that he's written himself. And he's also a very popular fiction author who creates the worlds in role playing games. And so when I thought about people who would be good people to um, communicate both like what that kind of work means and how to do that kind of work, and also how to develop your final projects, which are um, atlases, you know, an atlas style campaign world. I thought that Matt's insight into world building and his knowledge of the role playing game industry would be essential for you guys to learn from. So that said, Matt, the floor is yours. Take it away. We're excited to hear from you. Thank you, Aaron. Good to see you again. I sound pretty interesting. I don't know if I can actually live up to all that shit, but we'll give it a try. Okay. Uh, good to meet all you folks. Uh, those of you who have your cameras on, I actually taught at UW Stout last spring. And I know how it is like most people just shut their cameras down so they can see the other people. That's perfectly fine. Um, I uh, started out as a uh, gamer when I was growing up in Southern Wisconsin, which is where I live now in Beloit, Wisconsin. And about 45 miles, 45 minutes up the road, uh, maybe about 25 miles as the crow flies is a little town called Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, which was where TSR Hobbies started, which was the original publisher of Dungeons and Dragons way back in 1974. So uh, two years from now, we're going to have the 50th anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons. People at Wizards of the Coast who are the current publishers are all excited about that and doing all sorts of neat stuff. Um, I started out playing it when I was like 13 years old, a friend of mine across the street. Uh, his mother bought it for him for Christmas as a blue light special at Kmart, right? Which is something that nobody understands anymore because it's from 40 years ago. Um, and uh, but basically, man, it was a, a great deal. And she bought this cheap game and gave it to her kids. And then we ended up playing the hell out of it for the entire summer after that. Um, turns out that uh, I was able to then get into tournaments and do conventions here in town at Beloit College, which is right here in town as well. And my first convention, Gary Gygax showed up for, he's one of the inventors of Dungeons and Dragons and he signed a copy of my book. Uh, and I started going to conventions after that in Lake Geneva and such. Uh, as I started going to different conventions, my next thing, my, my next big one was Gen Con, which is the world's largest tabletop convention now, which out, outranks actually even the Spiele show in Essen, which is formerly the largest tabletop convention, which is where mostly German board games, German style board games are being done. Uh, role playing games were always the focus of Gen Con ever since, well, ever since TSR started. Originally, it was actually a war games convention held at the Horticultural Hall in downtown Lake Geneva. Um, this last year, I attended my 40th Gen Con in a row. So I've been going at it for quite some time. Um, uh, when I was in college, or even when I was in high school, I had a uh, what we would now call a zine called the Quill and Scroll, where I actually interviewed a whole bunch of people about uh, tabletop games and then came up with you know extra stuff for them. And me and my high school friends all did this together. And that turned into being an opportunity where I got to network with a lot of folks like Troy Denning and Steve Sullivan and, uh, and Gary and his crew uh, from early TSR days. And when I graduated from high school, I went off to college at the University of Michigan and a guy named Troy Denning who had been uh, with TSR and then also with a company called Pace Setter Games, which did chill and a whole bunch of other tabletop role-playing games back in the day, uh, recommended me to Will Niebling, who was uh, the world, he was the first vice president of TSR and had become a sales rep. So I started doing sales repping for gaming companies when I was in college. And while I was doing that, I would go to conventions and I would you know, I'd be demonstrating people's games for them. And uh, I would go up to them and say, hey, while you're doing that, you know, I could write that, I could edit that, you know, when you get home, think about me. So I ended up doing that. I actually got out of college and I um, ended up going to, uh, I got out of college in three years. I actually started out with an electrical engineering, computer science major and a creative writing major. I was going to get both of them in five years. And I decided after two years, I hated electrical engineering. And I was only in it because my parents told me I needed to get a safe job so I could do something you know, decent with my life. And then I would try to write in the evenings. And I realized I was lazy enough that if I tried to do that, I would never pull it off because I would you know, get home from a day of electrical engineering, computer science, and then 
say, screw it, I want to see my girlfriend, have a beer with my buddies, play a game, whatever. I was never going to get around to doing. So I dropped out of electrical engineering. I completed my creative writing degree in three years. When I got out of school, I went, I had never had any money or opportunity to travel much. So I got myself a work visa in England and the UK, flew over to the UK and somehow talked my way into a job at Games Workshop where the guys who published Warhammer, Warhammer 40,000 and lots of other uh, high quality games have been going at for 35, 40 years now. Uh, when I got back, I started freelancing uh, as a game designer and now I'm doing all sorts of different stuff. Uh, I have some visual aids here. So some of the first things I started out doing, like Aaron was talking about, is I edited source books. These are for second edition Dungeons and Dragons. So I edited the Age of Heroes and the complete book of Necromancers for second edition Dungeons and Dragons. Um, once I started doing that, I got into doing other things. I, a product came in called Chronomancer, which was the first product that uh, Lauren Coleman, who now runs uh, Catalyst Games, it was his first published gaming product. Uh, it had been sold to Mayfair Games, and then Mayfair got taken over by, or their role-playing game line got taken over by TSR. So they hired me in to develop that, and uh, it was called Chronomancer. It was about time-traveling wizards, and I got to be the developer on that, and I wrote about a third of the book. And then they started hiring me on to write my own stuff for it, including um, this was a setting for uh, Dark Sun, which was one, a setting that Troy Denning, who had actually originally been my friend when I was in high school, actually was one of the creators of this, Troy and Tim Brown. And uh, the lady's name is now escaping me, was married to Steve Winter. Uh, wonderful lady, uh, ran the, uh, Mary Kirchhoff, ran the TSR books department for many years. She was one of the main creators in this as well. So I did this and then ended up, uh, that was for second edition. I ended up writing books for third edition for the Forgotten Realms, which was developed by Ed Greenwood when he was like, starting when he was like five years old. Uh, I ended up, this was the last thing I ever edited for TSR, which was uh, a book about tabloid craziness that was written by Zeb Cook, who was then went on to become the lead writer for Elder Scrolls Online for like the last decade. And Zeb literally retired like last month. So finally, uh, the idea of a, you would have a game designer who could ever retire is kind of an amazing thing, right? Uh, when I was growing up, game design was not an occupation that you had. It was something, if you're lucky, somebody like Milton Bradley or Parker Brothers or Hasbro or whatever would license a game from you. And if it sold millions of copies, you could retire to the Caribbean. But uh, the idea that you would actually make a career out of this was non-existent, right? And the idea that there was actually, nowadays we have something on the order of two to 300 different colleges that are, and universities are providing game design degrees where people can study to become a game designer. One of my sons is actually doing that at University of Wisconsin Stout up in Menominee, Wisconsin right now. And that's, I actually taught a class there last term. Um, so the, the thought that this would be something that, you know, would grow into an art form that people would appreciate as an art form that you can make a living at uh, was kind of crazy, but you know we were making it up as we went along, just like Indiana Jones does in the in Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, we don't know, we don't have a plan. We're just coming up with it as we go. Um, so as I was doing this stuff, what else? Uh, they eventually dragged me into writing novels. So I wrote uh, this was uh, one of the first novels for Eberron, which was a setting designed by my friend Keith Baker, and I also wrote their first. Uh, chapter book series, I created this series, which was the Knights of the Silver Dragon, uh, which some of you may have been old enough to read when you were kids. And this came out like, uh, well, actually it was probably too old for that even. Uh, the years go quickly. So, uh, but that was the first time that they'd ever done any chapter books at TSR. And I, I created the series, wrote the first book and then the last two books. And I think it ran for like 14 novels. Uh, at this point, I've written like 35 some novels. Um, I can't tell you how many different games. I also wrote a couple editions of the Marvel Encyclopedia. I, uh, what else do I do? I write video games, but currently working on a number of different ones. Uh, I, but the big game I had that came out last year was something called Biomutant, which was developed by a friend of mine out in Sweden. There are so many sort of Biomutant, that's cool. Um, and I had a great time working on that. That was a guy I had met working in tabletop games, actually, after I got out of uh, working at Games Workshop. I was freelancing for a company called Target Games in Sweden. They did Mutant Chronicles and Mutant Year Zero and Cults and all sorts of other different games. And I did a lot of writing and editing for them over the years. And I kept in touch with them. So those are now the people who own Funcom and Conan the Barbarian and actually the entire library of Robert E. Howard uh, fiction. So um, 
but you know, I, I keep coming back to Dungeons and Dragons throughout my life. So while I did a lot of D&D writing over the years, uh, I haven't actually written too many things for Wizards of the Coast recently. I did write a year's worth. The funny part is I keep getting hired to write things licensed by other people for their stuff, uh, which often pays better than the actual writing for the game, which is odd, but there you go. So for instance, I wrote a year's worth of the Magic the Gathering comic book for IDW. Uh, I wrote, uh, let's see, this book, Dungeonology, which is, if you guys ever read the Ology series when you were growing up, there's like Dragonology and Spyology and UFOlogy. Well, one guy wrote all those and then this company licensed that from him and then turned around and licensed Dungeons and Dragons and they hired me to write the book. So it's one of these books that's got all sorts of little foldovers and pop-ups and neat stuff like that. And then this, you know, like here's a little book that comes in and good fun. And then the center of the book, it's got this crazy uh, pop-up map of the Forgotten Realms. It goes, whoa, like that. So it's good fun. Um, I wrote those. I wrote a uh, new Endless Quest series of books. There's six of those out now, which are choose your own adventure or pick a path books um, that, you know, you basically know dice mechanics. You just have to pick a path between various spots you want to go to. Um, and uh, let's see, what else have I written for them lately? That's about it for D&D &D recently. Um, I'm, I'm currently working on Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus, which was a uh, mobile video game that's being developed by a uh, group out of, by, what the hell is the name of the company here? Snowprint Studios, that's it, uh, which is being developed out of Sweden and Germany and such. And I'm, we're all working virtually. I work out of my office here in Wisconsin. Um, I, I worked on Assassin's Creed Origins. I worked on uh, tons of other games, Ghost Recon, a few different editions of it, um, and had a lot of fun with that. Uh, currently working on another video game that's not been uh, announced yet. So we have this thing called a non-disclosure agreement that a lot of us who work in this industry have to work under, which means that uh, you're not allowed to talk about what you're working on until it's been announced. So um, that one has not been announced, so I can't talk about that one. But uh, I have other games I'm working on. This is Shotguns and Sorcery, which is actually a, a role-playing game that uses the Cypher system by Monty Cook Games. Monty was one of the developers of third edition and was actually the uh, editor on my first big role-playing game book I ever did called Western Hero that we did for Iron Crown Enterprises way back in like 92 or something like that, right? And uh, so Monty and I have kept up over the years. We ended up licensing his system to do this, uh, this book here that is based upon a series of novels and stories that I've read. Um, and this, we actually just did a Kickstarter in November for a fifth edition version of that. So my son, who's now 23, my eldest son, is has wrote all the mechanics for that. And I wrote all the background stuff for it. I'm also doing the editing and production. Uh, Marty is my eldest son. He's you know kind of following in my footsteps doing this. Uh, one of the more shocking aspects of my life is that I actually have five children. Marty is the eldest of them. When he was born, I was running a company called Pinnacle Entertainment Group which did Deadlands, Brave New World. They do Savage Worlds nowadays and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but when Marty was born, we moved back to Wisconsin so we could be with people who would give us free babysitting, right? That's, a, that's what, where the value of grandparents really comes from. And about three years after we moved back, my wife got pregnant again with quadruplets. So we actually have four kids all born at the same time. And uh, they are now 19 years old and going to different colleges. One of them actually has dropped out looking for a job right now, but the others are all going to various colleges around, around the area. Um, so yeah, it's kind of funny. I do all this crazy stuff. I've got a wild career, but honestly, the wildest thing in my life has been the data quadruplets. Uh, what else? Um, oh yeah, the big thing I'm working on nowadays. I can say, I've got a stack of paper here that I can't show you anything. Oh, whoa. That's for the Marvel role-playing game. I'm actually working on the Marvel tabletop role-playing game that is coming out uh, this spring in about a couple months. And uh, so Marvel actually hired me directly to write this role-playing game for them. So whereas a lot of times when you work on something like this, it's a licensed property, you write for another publisher. Uh, Marvel actually said, we want to do this book and we're going to hire Matt to write it. We actually, I'm working with a couple of different designers who helped me out at the beginning of it. And, but I've been taking the ball from there since, geez, it's been about a year now that I've been working on my own on it. And the game will be coming out, like I said, we're going to be doing a play test edition that'll come out in uh, either Mar uh, March or April. And it's going to be a hundred and some page book that'll retail for $10. It'll be sold where comic books and games are sold. And then uh, we're going to take feedback from everybody. We're actually going to do a public play test of this. And we're going to be able to have it. Um, uh, then we're going to do a big full, you know, 
uh, eight and a half by 11, 300 some page hardcover book as the launch to a whole series of these books coming out in 2023. So that's a lot. Uh, I do this kind of stuff. I've also written uh, like comic books. I've done uh, movie scripts. One got produced by a, a very B-level fun thing, but it was it was fun. I got to play a zombie in it. Um, I've done, uh, I did an uh, installation for a museum where I actually concocted a uh, choose your own adventure game where where you walk from one way to the other actually decided which path you picked. And it was through an audio app. So it would tell you the story as you went along with depending on which way you walked through the streets of old milwaukee at the milwaukee public museum um any all sorts of different kinds of stuff like this it's good fun um yeah you're not allowed to look at that stuff it's behind me good luck on that so i see somebody in chat saying kevin feige will take me out he probably would marvel takes their seri their their uh, security on this stuff extremely seriously as do i because i like to respect the people who hire me to do this stuff because uh, I'd like to get hired back <laughs> at the end of the day, or, you know, just have people respect me and what I do. So that's, that's a good thing as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I understand you're talking about Dungeons and Dragons these days with an emphasis on world building. I've done a lot of world building over the years, I often participate in the uh, writers, uh, they got the writer's symposium, which is a slate of different panels that they do uh, at Gen Con and in a lot of different other conventions as well uh, to teach people about this kind of stuff. Uh, the, the bitter dark secret of world building is we're all making it up, right? And that's uh, that's the fun part of it. You get to base it on things that you want to do and what, you know crazy ideas you have. The main rule about it is to try to be consistent, right? If you say something is true over here and you say something contradicting over here, that's maybe a bad thing. On the other hand, it can also be a very interesting thing where you can spur off that and come up with creative solutions for how you screwed that up, right? Uh, I did that in a game I did called Brave New World, which was a dystopian supers game that came out back in 1999. And uh, at one point in the game, we decided, or I, I wrote that the character uh, had been um, you know, alive in the 60s and alive in the 90s, right? And I'm like, oh, I screwed that up. How did I do that? Well, then I came up with an explanation later on. I'm like, that was actually the original Patriot. And then he handed it down. The mask has gone to different people over the years. And, you know, just created a story out of that that I would never have come up with if I hadn't screwed it up, right? So your mistakes can actually be inspiration for you in a lot of ways. Don't feel afraid of going through and just being ridiculously creative at any point and then deciding that, oh, I can fix the mistakes as you go later. One of the neat things about doing stuff creatively is that it's all just a draft, right? It's uh, your first draft, second draft, whatever. Until you actually produce stuff and put it in front of people, you don't really have to worry about whether or not it's too terribly consistent or holds together well. That's part of the iterative process that you go through when you're creating things. Uh, and even when it's been produced, you can do that glorious old retcon where you're like, well, this is what actually happened. And I can tell you the story behind this. And you can come up with creative ways to do that. Comic book writers have been coming up with different ways to explain things for decades, ever since Stan Lee started to come up with, you know, how does Captain America exist in 1963 instead of 1945? Uh, well, he was frozen in a block of ice and here he is. Now he comes back to you. Uh, so we have all sorts of different ways to do that. Um, I could ramble on about myself for decades, and I've managed to do it before. Usually, I'm in a bar with a glass of beer in front of me. Here, I'm just with a, a LaCroix, so it's a lot easier. But uh, I'd be happy to talk to you guys and answer questions about anything you have to ask. I, I have uh, a lot of talents. One of them is not mind reading. So uh, I'd rather answer your questions rather than guess at what you want me to talk about. Does that make sense? Is that a good place to pause? Good. Now, here's the LaCroix to you guys. Hey, Matt, I'm just going to keep talking. Meeting you've Wisconsin, got, by the way. So <laughs> there you go. You've got a ton of hands raised. Um, I don't know if you want either Aaron, Aaron or I can call on them. Or I'm going to let you guys who know these students and know what they're doing and all that kind of stuff call them if that's, if that's okay. Yeah, totally. Um, I just want to start by saying, awesome to have you here. Um, I'm, I'm going to be selfish and start with my own question. I'm sorry, Please. students. <laughs> um, but I think, I think we'll all have kind of very similar questions. At some point during, during your speaking to us, you mentioned that you went to Ireland and somehow talked your way into a gig with the, the folks who were doing Warhammer 40k. Yeah. I'd love to hear more about how that somehow went. I think oh, that's a, really a lot story. of us, uh, you know, need those, those practical tips. Right. Um, well, there's nothing practical days. about the answer, but I can tell you the story. Anyway. So, <laughs> uh, it actually was in Ireland, although I've been to Ireland a couple of times. Um, it was in the UK, right? So uh, mm -hmm. uh, what happened is I flew over. Uh, when I got out of college, I wanted to visit a friend of mine who was in Spain, who had been an exchange student when I was a kid in high school. And I so I'm like, okay, but I don't have any money. How do I get over there? 
uh, well, I, let's see if I can work my way over there. How do I do that? Well, it turns out Spain doesn't have an exchange program or a student visa program. So I'm like, I'm screwed there. So uh, what do I do? I found the nearest country of which I spoke the language and I happened to be England. And I got myself a student work visa there. And I flew over there. My dad got me a one-way ticket as my graduation present from college. My mother, uh, I think, got me luggage. And, uh, you know, they were divorced, but they're like, okay, both supporting me at the time. And they're like, yeah, well, you're on your own. You're an adult now. Good, good luck and have fun. So I flew over to England with $600 in my pocket and didn't know anybody in the entire continent except for that one kid in Spain, which is, as you know, a long way from uh, London. So um, I ended up, call, I, I think I got on a Wednesday, I called up Games Workshop and said, I saw an ad in White Dwarf, which is her magazine. And I understand you're looking for an editor. I had done some editing in college. I had worked for Gary Gygax's second company, which was New Infinities. I had edited novels and a couple of gaming products from there. And uh, they said, sure, come on in a Monday and we'll interview. And I, like the next day I realized that my $600 was barely gonna make me through the weekend. So I was screwed. So I called them up and said, could we move that date up just a little bit? And they said, yeah, come in Friday. So I show up on Friday to the, uh, to the design studio, Games Workshop Design Studio in Nottingham, England. And you know, take the train up there, walk over the state or from the station. And I show up in a suit and tie, and they give me the tour and they do the interview, and everybody laughs at me because I'm wearing a suit and tie to a game company, where you know the, the most everybody's the, the clean cut people, the people who don't have paint all over their their pants, right? Because what happens is these miniature painters who are sitting there painting these little figures all day just wipe the brush on their pant leg as they go, so they have like crusty pant legs from you know from their knee to their hip. Um, and those you can tell the miniature painters from. So uh, they bring me through there, they, they interview me the job, and then they send me away with an editing test. And uh, they say, uh, here's your editing test, bring it back on Monday, and we'll let you know how it goes. Uh, and of course, you know, proper British editing marks. And I'm like, yes, yes, I do. I know those. I, I, but I know the American version it might take me a little while to get up to speed. So editing marks were back from the day when we actually did all this stuff literally on paste up where these uh, you actually had when you worked on a computer instead of actually printing out they would go down to a linotype machine in the basement of the building and they would print out these things on scrolls that you would then literally paste down on blue lined pieces of paper that they would send to the printer be photographed to make photographic plates that the users were printing right uh, and when you were correcting this stuff you would put the scroll on your desk, take a red pen, and you'd make these special marks. The typesetter downstairs would know how to change things. Much different than we do it nowadays, where you can just edit things in InDesign on the fly. Um, and I'm like, I don't know any of this stuff. I did a little bit of it in high school when I was working at the student newspaper. But I got back to, England, to London that night, went to um, Piccadilly Circus, found the nearest bookstore, bought myself a Queen's English dictionary that had editing marks in the back of it, taught myself everything I needed to know took the editing test, showed up on Monday and said, hey, with everything I owned and two duffel bags on my back and said, hey guys, uh, either today you really need to give me a job or my dad's best friend's boss's daughter lives in Cambridge and she's willing to give me a couch to sleep on for two weeks while I find a bartending job, right? And they're like, um, okay, we'll hire you. And I'm like, holy shit, I can't believe that worked, right? Um, so I ended up working there for six months I ended up living with a guy named William King or Bill King, who's now a best-selling author. Uh, he writes uh, uh, World of Warcraft novels, amongst many other things, wrote a ton of novels for Games Workshop. Uh, we were roommates for six months. At the end of it, um, they actually offered me a full-time permanent position as my visa was expiring. Uh, but my girlfriend back home said, you know, really, if you're going to be in England uh, full-time for, you know, years, and she still had a couple of years of college left, uh, we should probably cut it off here. I'm like, mm, well, I can always find another job. So I went back to the to the United States on Valentine's Day, 1990, to be with my girlfriend, and that that was my wife of 29 years, the mother of my five children. So it worked out pretty well for me. But really, it was a matter of me just you know going through there and saying, I got you know, if I end up doing bartending, it's fine. If not, you know, great, I, even better. So I'll do this crazy job, and it worked out really well for me. Yeah, thank you for that story with the very sweet ending. Thank um, you. Yeah, well, like I said, you know, it worked fantastically well. <laughs> yeah. Aaron, do you, do you want to call on students? Yeah, or? no, I, I'm, I'll just do some of the, the moderation. So um, I'm going to get the hands as they go into the queue, but there there is a question in chat that seems relevant. So okay. we lose it. Um, 
please raise your hands though for most questions, um, but this one was good. So uh, uh, our student, Natalie Juarez asks, what's something fun you would mention about your job if you were at a bar right now? I, I felt like the bartending was a good connection. There so. we go. No, I uh, actually, that's why I got actually got a bartending certificate when I was in college from the University of Michigan and uh, never used it professionally. But what would I mention about my job if I was at a bar? I, drinking games, probably, right? Uh, a lot of game designers like to play drinking games. Uh, and we had a lot of fun ones that we did when we were in bars. And uh, the funny part is actually when I went to Games Workshop, I was, I was dry. I had been a pretty hardcore drinker when I was in college and high school. Uh, to the point where I, my friends and I could literally polish off a case of beer each in the course of a night, right? Like 24 bottles each. It, it was ridiculous. Um, and I realized I needed to dry out. So when I went to England, I actually wasn't drinking at all for the first uh, three, four months I was there. Um, and uh, they made fun of me right? <laughs> relentlessly. They're like, oh, sure. American wants a Coke, a Coca-Cola. Cut that boy off. He's had too many. Um, but then I was, uh, I ended up being in Ireland over the holidays. My girlfriend came out to spend the holidays with me. We went to Ireland, spent uh, before Christmas, spent Christmas in the UK, and then went to Spain to finally visit my buddy in Spain over the New Year's. And uh, while we were in Ireland, we were at a bar literally across the street from the Guinness Brewery. And my friend Ronan Lynch, who is a reporter and a, and a lot of great stories about Ronan, but also was the namesake for the main zombie gunslinger in Deadlands because I thought it was such a great name. But Ronan Lynch waves a pint of Guinness under my nose and says, oh, come on, Matt, you know you want it. And I'm like, ah, shit, you're right. So uh, I fell off the wagon there. I haven't gotten back on since. But, um, but you know, it's you don't oh, have hair. to drink to be a game designer, but it doesn't hurt, right? <laughs> um, thanks, Matt. Um, next hand up is Aaron. Hi, um, I had a couple of questions, if that's all right. Uh, I didn't want to take too much time. But um, firstly, uh, how do you kind of handle writer's block? Because I know sometimes, especially because world building can be so like overwhelming, you, it can get a little just like difficult to fully fill, fill out a world. Um, also, like, do you have a favorite project that you've done until now? And then my last one is, how do you kind of keep up with the ever evolving D and D community and their kind of interests, or just like what is fun for players at the time? Okay, so writer's block. What was the second one? Writer's block, D and D community. Uh, favorite, yeah, uh, favorite project. Writer's okay. block, favorite, yeah, favorite project, D and D community. Okay. So writer's block, uh, I don't get right. Uh, part of that's because I've been a working writer since I got out of college, and if you have writer's block, you starve. Right. So that's a very bad thing. That's what we call motivation. Right. People say, how do you keep motivated to writing all this stuff? I've been fairly prolific. I got a couple of bookshelves full of stuff I published over here. And the reason is because I literally would do this when I was younger, but I would put my my lease or my mortgage over my desk. And that was just like the sword of Damocles sitting there saying, get your ass moving. You do not have time to screw around. Um, so part of it is just developing discipline. And honestly, I'm not a terribly disciplined person. Like I mentioned, if I thought I had been disciplined, I would have stuck with computer science and did the stuff in the evening. Uh, I figured jumping in the deep end was the only way to do it. On a practical level, uh, the way I get around having writer's block is by writing outlines, right? And this is something that not everybody likes to do, but something I find very helpful for me, and especially since I started out doing uh, work for hire or tie-in work for other people. A lot of the times before they want you to sit down and write a whole book, whatever the heck it is, if it's a D and D book or a novel or whatever, they want to have an outline from you. Like when I write Halo novels, I've written three Halo novels or a Minecraft novel was the last thing I did, that kind of stuff. Um, they want to have a novel outline from you that says, this is what I'm going to write. And it's in your interest to do this because the worst thing you can do is write a whole freaking novel, turn it in and have them say, no, that wasn't what we wanted at all, right? So you want, if there's any kind of issues of plot, characters, themes, topics you want to cover, all that kind of stuff, you want to do that at the outline stage where the, uh, the changes are easy to make. Don't cost you a whole lot in terms of time and effort and all that stuff. But if you go ahead and write a whole book and they have to turn around and say, and they have to say, yeah, throw out half of that or throw out the entire thing. You're like, what did I just waste all my time on? And I, I feel like an idiot. And now I'm, I'm not able to pay my rent this month and blah, blah, blah. So I always outline stuff. Now, my secret for outlines, though, is to make them very short. So for instance, if I'm writing a novel, I'll figure out roughly how many chapters I need to write. I'll usually then try to come up with 10% less chapters than that. So 90% of the chapters. So if it's a, you know, uh, 
50 chapter book, which is ridiculous. I'd write 40 chapters on, in my outline and uh, no, 45, I guess. And because I know that some of them I'll overwrite. I just know that for myself in the past. And then I will write one, two to three sentences for each chapter and say, this is what this chapter is about. And then I uh, go through and just basically fill in those index cards, so to speak, and write the book. The neat thing about that is that if I get to a certain point in the creative process where I say, oh, I got a much better idea, because that's one of the things about writing. Writing is an act of discovery as much as it is for the, as for the writer, as much as it is for the reader, right? So as you're writing it, you're like, oh, I'm figuring this stuff out. I'm actually seeing when the idea hits the page, what happens? Does it splat? Does it dance away? Does it stick the landing? You have to figure all that stuff out. And if you have a very thin outline like that, it gives you a guide to where you're going, but you don't feel bad about throwing it out if you come up with a better idea. If you've done a 20,000 word outline already and you come up with a better idea, like, no, but if I do that, I'll screw everything up and I'm screwed. Then that's when people get stuck again. But if you say, well, I have to throw out a, a couple pages worth of outline, who cares, right? And then you just move on and do the right. Uh, second question is my favorite project. That's like asking your favorite child, like they always say. My favorite project in the moment is the Marvel tabletop role-playing game I'm working on because, man, let me tell you, that's a dream of mine as a kid to be able to take, uh, I grew up reading comics. I wrote tons of, I've written comics. I've worked on Marvel encyclopedias and stuff. And then be able to take that and turn it into a role-playing game. Having Actually, I worked on the last Marvel role-playing game as well about 10 years ago. And, and I started playing, I, one of the games I used to play at conventions was Marvel role-playing, Marvel superheroes, the original one that I would run for the role-playing games, gamers association at Gen Con, which is how I got to meet Jeff Grubb and Steve Winter who were the creators of this stuff. And Jeff actually ended up co-writing a Guild Wars novel for me that I wrote for Guild Wars 2 back when he was actually working in-house and I was the outside writer they hired. Um, so for me, that's really cool to be working on that. Uh, for, on a personal level, uh, Shotguns and Sorcery is a lot of fun for me because um, not only is it based on stories that I've come up with, but I'm working on it with my eldest son. And to be able to do that kind of stuff and have a team of people like Rob Schwalb, who's my, my developer on it for the fifth edition stuff, guys I've known for years, and, uh, I have a great team of art, artists working on it as well. That's just a kick, right? And that, at the end of the day, I own that. Whereas with the Marvel stuff, I don't own that. That's owned by Disney, right? Disney writes nice checks and they, you know, that's a lot more exposure, but uh, I don't get to own any of that. It belongs to somebody else. My stuff, you know, I can do stuff with whatever I want, which is fine. And last is how do I keep up the D and D community? Uh, I don't. It's impossible at this point because holy cow, has it grown over the years, right? Uh, it used to be that you could keep up with the D and D community. You could keep up with the entire gaming community back in the '90s or even up until the 2000s, right? Um, but over the last 10 years, it's just especially since Fifth Edition came out, it's gone zing and exploded. I blame a lot of that on things like Critical Role and the uh, actual play movement and things like that, just bringing it out to a wider audience in a way that uh, we've never really seen before. Um, it used to be, I could tell you, every game designer out there was working on, as a tabletop role-playing game designer. Now it's almost impossible, right? Especially if you toss in all the indies and such. Um, Robin Laws, who's a pretty well-known game designer, has worked on you know third, fourth, fifth edition, plus a bunch of other stuff, would often say, you know, there are more to give you an idea, you'd say there are more astronauts in the world than there are full-time role-playing or full-time game designers out there. And there are probably more Chinese astronauts than there are full-time role-playing, tabletop role-playing game designers. And, you know, he was probably right up until about five years ago, maybe less now, um, that uh, we've gotten just this incredible burst of people doing stuff. I keep up with people mostly by going to conventions, going on Twitter, uh, doing appearances, you know, at different things and having fun that way. Um, and it's kind of neat that it's grown beyond me. At one point, I was looking, I would, you know, I would mentor people as I came into the industry, and I'd look around saying, Jesus, if nobody else shows up, the whole thing's going to die off. We're going to be like old, old white dudes just hanging around, like with model railroads in our basements, you know, and nobody's going to pay attention. It's going to be just die off. It's going to be some curiosity people talk about. Um, but that's, I think, just that's one of the great things about it now. It's so vibrant. We have people from all walks of life, genders and races and, uh, and whatever else just playing games like this together. I'm just so thrilled to see it being widely accepted like that and to bring everybody in. That was a lot of answers. There you go. Thank you for answering my questions. Happy to help. <laughs> All right, uh, next is Ben. Yeah, um, so so f first of all, big fan of uh, d and and Warhammer and all forms of that. So it's great to get this sort of uh, interaction between someone who's had a uh, part in tons of stuff I love. Um, 
but so I wanted to ask about, uh, so you've done so much, you've worked with so many different systems, uh, like whether that be, you know, role-playing games or even like, uh, or writing for uh, different genres and things of that nature. So is there anything that's kept consistent throughout the creation process or is it, are all the different systems like a totally different beast to work with? Well, I mean, at a certain level, every system is its own animal, right? It's its own piece of art and you're, you're working within the parameters they set up. But at a basic level, uh, especially when you're doing game design, world building, especially game design, uh, the main thing that makes it the same is that your job as a writer, or especially as a game designer, or as a game designer as well, but especially as a writer, is to make that game as clear as possible to the people who are playing it and reading it, right? One of the odd things about role-playing games is they often end up being, you know, especially if you look at Dungeons and Dragons, like hundreds of pages, right? These are not simple games. These are not the games you grew up with. Or, you know, when I was a kid, Monopoly, you pull open the box and then the rules would be on the inside of the lid because they were too cheap to actually even print a rule book for it, much less in color. They're printed in black and white on the inside of the lid. And the trick though, is that even at that level, you have to strive for clarity, right? You have to st strive for consistency. Those are the things that communicate to people more than anything else. So if I say, if I start talking about abilities over here, and then suddenly I'm talking about traits over here, and I mean the same thing, the reader is not going to understand what you're talking about. Like you basically have to define terms in the same kind of sense that you would with a, with a computer game, right? With a computer program, your terms are defined and then they stay that way. So if I'm talking about these, that's what this means. If I talk about this, this is what this means. And you always have to strive for clarity over anything else. Actually, sometimes I get hired by different companies. Uh, there was a Yu-Gi-Oh game, Yu-Gi-Oh Capsule Monsters that Mattel hired me to write the rules for a few years ago. And uh, they, I didn't design the game at all. Uh, they had game designers in house who did it all, but they hired me to write the rule book because they needed somebody who could communicate the game they had come up with to the players in a way that they could just pick up and go. With. Nowadays, it, we have the, so many different ways to do this. We Not only do you get the rules, but you get people doing actual plays. They teach you during videos. They, you know, they say, you know, a lot of rule books say, don't read the rule book, go here to YouTube slash whatever, and, you know, and watch and we'll teach you how to play, which is great. But honestly, when you're stuck in the middle of something, you can't remember what a rule is, or you uh, need an interpretation. Nobody goes back to the YouTube video and tries to scroll through to whatever spot they need. They left off at, you need to have the rules be as clear and coherent as possible. Uh, the other interesting challenge for a role-playing game or any kind of game, really, is that they get at least two uses, which is that the first one is to teach people how to play the game, and the second one is to be a reference for people who already know how to play the game, and they have to be effective at both of those. And if you're doing uh, something that's a lot of storytelling, lore, and all that, it also has to be an entertaining read to people who want to read it just for that. So you have that, and when you're doing game systems, especially tabletop role-playing games, there's that trifecta of reasons that you need to, of re, the way that these books are digested by people. As a writer, you need to cater to all those. And it's a real challenge. It's not, I don't see that in a whole lot of other fields, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons that are like, well, if you're a game designer and you're, you just want to be a novelist. I'm like, no, that's, you bring in novelists, you bring in people doing this stuff because they have the skills to do these kind of things. And you, you sit at this really intriguing crossroads where a, a lot of different skills become necessary. Uh, it's rare to have people who can do all these things. Nowadays with large companies, you have people who can, um, you know, you'll subdivide out those tasks to different people. Uh, I've been doing it long enough. I actually know I can do everything from producing a game from coming up with the idea to getting it to print to selling it into stores. But the only thing I don't do is draw artwork because I suck at artwork, right? Um, my, my, I actually have taken drawing classes and I look over and say, yeah, this is not my career and I threw it away, right? Uh, I, I ended up working with Jim Lee on the Wildstorms collectible card game back in the mid 90s. And Jim is now the head creative officer of DC Comics and uh, draws most of the Batmans and Supermans and Wonder Womans, whatever you see. And he's a fantastic artist. He's the guy who's just dedicated. He's also a hardcore gamer, which is one of the reasons he brought me in to help him work in that game uh, with our co designer, Drew Bittner, back in the day. So you got people who cross over, but you want to bring in people with specialties as well. And you get to decide whether or not you want to be a jack of all trades or a specialist or, you know, some combination thereof. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Uh, next is Matthew. Good name. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so I have a couple of questions. So first off, uh, it kind of pertains to your writer's block. Have you always been able to just do that? Did you always have that motivation to do that? 
or did you have to work and practice? <laughs> or did you have to work and practice to let your ideas flow? We just discussed a lot of spontaneity in the class and how people usually have like guards that just kind of oh, yeah. no. uh, block off the ideas. So how did you work towards letting everything just out all together? Well, you know, I, I did, um, I wrote stories when I was a kid, like for competitions and stuff like that for classes. I would write stuff for fun. But honestly, nothing motivates like a deadline, right? Whether it's a class deadline or a paid deadline or whatever else. Um, and I have this terrible tendency to run straight up toward a deadline, like I'm playing chicken with it, up until I know that if I don't start right goddamn now, I am going to screw this up, right? Um, and the reason is at that point, I can, I basically force the critical parts of my brain to get the hell out of my way, right? You have to be able to just say, you know what? It doesn't matter if this sucks. It just needs to be done. I will put as much effort in this and much skill and talent and whatever else I have into it. But the main thing is to produce it because if you don't produce it, nobody ever gets to read it. Nobody ever gets to play it. Nobody ever gets to grade it, whatever the hell it is. Um, and if I didn't have that, I, you know, part of it's not just that I, uh, I have a hard time getting out of my way. It's that I would rather do other things. Right? I'd rather go play a video game. I'd rather, you know, have a date night with my wife. I'd rather see my kids, whatever. Uh, so if it wasn't for the deadline, I'd probably be like, well, I'm on vacation this week, right? Now, that's kind of an ironic thing because as my wife and kids know, I'm almost never on vacation, even when we're on vacation. I'm often working then. Uh, we took about the Rocky Mountains once for a camping trip, uh, driving out from uh, here in Wisconsin. And I actually ended up while everybody was asleep at night, sitting out in Rocky Mountain National Park on the picnic table, writing a GI Joe short story that I had a deadline for that was at the end of the week, right? I'm like, everybody's asleep, I get to work, you know, that's how it works. Uh, but the thing is, I love that. I wouldn't want to really trade it for anything else. Um, but I think part of it, when you're trying to do that is just find a way to get around yourself. Uh, a lot of times what happens is your own editor kicks into your head and says, that's stupid, it'll never work, right? Or nah, it's not up to snuff or whatever. You need to just tell that guy to shut up. Tell him to get out of your way. Uh, you're, you're busy now. You need to get this work done. Uh, the neat thing about it is once you get something down on paper or on your Word document or whatever the hell you're working in, Google Docs, Canvas, et cetera, once you get it down there, then you can fix it. If you don't have something down there, you can't fix it. It's not wrong. It's not right. It doesn't even exist. But if you put something down, it turns out it's fantastic. More power to you. You're, you're a genius and we'll all follow you to the next place. But if you put something down and it's not quite right, then you can say, okay. And then you put your editor's hat on and then you start doing it. But you need to get that editor, the person who says this is wrong and shove them aside until you can actually just do the creative process, right? Um, and sometimes, you know, the, the most fun I've had is just somebody saying, give me an idea right now. And you're like, well, I don't know. This is a stupid idea. I'll just come up with something off the top of my head. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, the neat thing is, uh, people say, where do you get your ideas? And if you're a creative person, you probably have thousands of them. The question is not how do you get ideas? It's how do you get them to stop, right? Or <laughs> more of the question, how do you winnow them down to a good idea, right? So that's always the trick is figuring that out. For me, a lot of times, if I have an idea, I don't even bother to write it down. I've written lots of ideas down and I'll come back to them, you know, five, 10, 15 years later and say, yeah, that was a good idea, but it didn't stick with me enough. It wasn't sticky enough to make me want to go back to it until I read it. The, guy, the idea is that I know I want to pursue are the ones that just will not let me go and keep dragging me down and kicking me in the back of the head up until I say, yeah, okay, fine. Okay, okay, fine. I'll go do that. Okay. There you go. Um, that was really, thank you for that. Um, I also have just a second question because I'm, I'm curious about it. You, uh, you've told us all about the things that you have done um, and all your successes, but what, in your opinion, would be your biggest, like, Failure or a mistake? Are ah, you going to be painful with me now? Okay. Um, my biggest <laughs> failure at the moment is one that's been hanging over my head forever. Um, back in 2012, I did this thing called 12 for 12, uh, which was this crazy ambitious project I started. And again, it was a matter of me wanting to give myself a deadline and try to do something crazy. But uh, I decided I was a fast writer. I write about 5,000 words a day when I'm cooking. Uh, and I can do that like regular like clockwork, right? Um, and so I figured, you know, I'd write 12 novels that year, right? It was 2012. Uh, I do 12 novels, one novel a month. I gave myself a break by making them 50,000 word novels, which are still novels, but short novels. 
And I ran a Kickstarter. For, I broke them into trilogies and I ran a Kickstarter for every trilogy and I managed to do them all, right? The funny part was as I was developing the third trilogy, uh, I realized I had already pitched that to an editor at Tor Books a couple of years before that. And he had never given me an answer. So I contacted him and said, do you want this book or not? Because I'm about to write it, whether you care about it or not. And uh, after a little going back and forth, he said, yeah, I'll buy it. I'm like, shut. So um, I ended up having to come up with a whole nother trilogy off the top of my head, which was fun. And uh, I sold the guy the book. I still have not written it. It's been, it'll be overdue by nine years. So I, I suppose I signed a contract 10 years ago in say August of this year, right? And it's killing me not to get this done. Well, the reason I haven't got it done is the, the, uh, the gentleman who signed the contract with me was fired within months after that for uh, sexual harassment. And I was booted over to another editor and they didn't have time to talk to me about it for a while. So I didn't have time. And that just kind of screwed up my schedule that I had set aside for working on. And she was very kind to me about it, said, you know, whenever you get a chance to do this, I know you have other things you're doing, turn it in. And they even offered to let me off the hook a few years later. But I am freaking determined to write this goddamn book because uh, I also have like two or three other novels on right after that. That's my the biggest disappointment for me creatively right at the moment, right? I mean, I've had other things where like I tried to do this, it didn't work out, whatever. But that's one that's just like, ah, uh, it's uh, what's the right metaphor? I don't know. It's it's, the, it's just this. No, it's my white whale at the moment, right? I'm going to bring this mother down one way or the other. So. Thank you so much. This is really cool. Every time my kids are late with their homework and I give them a hard time, they go, "Yeah, Dad, how about that book?" <laughs> uh, next up is Mia. Hi, Mia. Hi, um, I really, I, I don't know, it's just so interesting to hear your stories about um, basically kind of navigating the landscape that is, that was early, uh, early days game design. It's just so interesting how, um, how things sort of just happened and how they just sort of came together in a weirdly perfect way. It's just interesting and in your uh, range of expertise in a variety of genres. I was wondering, um, as uh, someone who's, trying to figure out how to write stuff and create stories. Um, has there ever been a time where um, you had an idea since you were a kid and you've just sort of held on to it and you never had the moment to sort of put it to paper? And at some point you had the opportunity to turn it into something really special. Uh, if so, what was that idea and how did it kind of Well, uh, let's see, the first novel I wrote that was an original novel was an idea that I had like when I was in college, and I don't think I wrote it until I was in my 30s. Um, it was the, it was called a book called Amortals, uh, like you know, not immortal or mortal, but amortal. And it was about people who could back up their brains and then restore them into clone bodies. Um, and the scene that stuck with me was this guy who wakes up after he's been revived, and uh, he he has, realizes that he has been murdered. Not only has been murdered, but it's been recorded, spread on the internet. And in a, gr a very vicious public grisly fashion. And now he has to go out and solve his own murder, right? So it's a detective science fiction story. Uh, I wrote this up, uh, I, I, it stuck with me forever. And then uh, what happened is funny enough, you know, this is how your life works. You know, this all starts to spill, spill together. One of the guys at Games Workshop that I had known was a guy named Mark Escon, who had actually been fired before I got there. And I didn't even work with him at Games Workshop, but we would meet together in bars with some of the other people at the pubs in uh, Nottingham. And uh, uh, years later, Mark ended up starting the Black Library, which was the uh, fiction imprint for Games Workshop. And he hired me on to write novels for that. And I ended up writing novels for this game called Blood Bowl, which is fantasy football, which is just crazy stuff. Uh, it's like elves and dwarves and halflings and vampires and whatever playing football in hyper violent ways. But it's all very tongue in cheek where you have like they're drinking killer genuine draft and Bloodweiser is their big sponsor and things like that. Um, and so I ended up writing these novels, which is crazy. And then Mark ended up going off and starting a new imprint for uh, a new company called Angry Robot, which is originally an imprint of HarperCollins and then has been spun off several different times now. And he asked me to pitch him some novels. And I pitched him that one. He's like, yeah, that one, write that one. And it was just, it was great. The funny part is that, and it'll be the way with the novel I'm working on now, is that uh, the story changed lots and lots of times over the years, over like the 15 years before, between when I came up for it, when I actually got to write it, mostly because I had changed and my interest had changed, right? So 
something I had been really intrigued about the main idea of the plot had changed, but a lot of the wrappings around it originally had been something that was more of a, a military special ops kind of a thing. You know, uh, you know, the black helicopter flies in, picks you up and takes you off, blah, blah, blah. Um, but this became much more politically oriented. Uh, turned out that the victim slash protagonist was actually the, uh, was the world's oldest man who was a secret service agent who had been revived after saving the president's life the first time and is coming back after I believe like his sixth or seventh uh, resurrection at this point. And only people who can afford this treatment are actually given it. So it's really a metaphor for the American healthcare system and how people are treated badly if they're not of the elite or very wealthy, right? Uh, and that was something I probably wouldn't come up with in my 20s, but in my 30s was very much on my mind. So um, so I think, you know, hold on to those ideas, enjoy them, and, you know, treasure them. If you don't have time to work on them now, don't throw away your ideas. I mean, stuff, you know, I have a, f tons of folders and files on my desktop or my, on my um, computer. There are things I've cut out of other things or had better ideas for or whatever. Just toss them in there. Eventually, they might come back to be useful for you. I had a game called Dracula's Revenge that I did that I sold to Grenadier Models back in like 1991. And then I ended up being published with... Uh, Green Ronin and Human Head Studios in like 2002. And I just, you know, I'd sold it to them. They went bankrupt. I sold it to another company. They went bankrupt. It just kept being like a cursed game. And eventually I sold it again and it got out there and got published. You know, just, it's funny how things will uh, keep coming back for you that way. Thank you. Uh, that was really reassuring. I feel like hearing stuff about um, sort of deadline brain and um, that sort of, just having those ideas kind of come back. It, it, I don't know. It feels really reassuring. Um, it Glad feels like um, a lot of goals uh, kind of become a little more reachable, I guess. So um, Yeah. I mean, when I got you. out of college, I wanted to be a novelist, right? And I, I didn't really, uh, nobody said, hey, there's a game design. Uh, no, the idea that I could be a game designer as a full-time uh, thing was ridiculous in those days. There weren't many people doing it, right? But it kept falling into my lap, so I kept doing it, right? Uh, and for many years, I used to do this, this hustle where I was looking for work. I haven't had a hustle for jobs for, God, a decade maybe, right? People just come to me nowadays, which is really kind of convenient, but, um, and it's a good problem to have. On the other hand, my brain also says, what about those dreams you have for these other things? I'm like, yeah, 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 but I got this paying work right here in front of me. It's so cool. Like, I was going to give up doing tie-in novels at one point, and then I got offered Halo novels. I'm like, oh, I freaking love Halo, so I'm going to write Halo novels. You know, and I got offered a Minecraft now. I'm like, oh, my kids love Minecraft. I'll do that. Good problems to have. But, you know, you, you sometimes take sidesteps, but life hopefully will bring you back to where you want to be. And often you find out you're in a wonderful place, whether that was what you intended or not, if you're lucky. Uh, the last thing it all goes to, to shit. I'm, so. I'm sorry, the last thing was just like a quick tie-in. Um, that amoral story sounded really interesting. I've been trying to write a sci-fi story and it, it I, sounds like the coolest thing ever do you know where i could find that uh immortals is out of print right now huh i mean, uh, again bummer. this is the problem like i actually had the, the rights revert back to me about five years ago and i actually have a friend of mine who gave me new covers for it i'm all set to do it i have to actually just sit down run a kickstarter put them out there again whatever and i just struggle to find the time to do this kind of stuff um so i've got three novels that i have to do that with and uh like for instance i have a uh, the fourth trilogy of those uh, trilogies I was doing for 12 for 12 was a series called Monster Academy. I released the first book, haven't even bothered to release the last two. And already, I, it's actually going to be a board game next year coming out from uh, Calliope Games, right? So I'm like, okay, I sold them on that. I should probably get around to releasing the other two novels. Um, so it, it's a challenge. If you look for more, actually, honestly, if you email me, I'll send you a copy. Right. Email okay, me at matt at forbeck.com. I'd be happy to send you a copy. There's no reason that somebody shouldn't read it if they want to. Yeah, the concept sounds absolutely, it just sounds so cool. It sounds Thank like you. right, I, yeah. Well, when I was writing for Angry Robot, they would call me the king of the high concept. That was their way to brand me. So I always had a great time doing that. The second book was, was called Vegas Nights with a K, and it was about uh, kids who learn a little magic and then go off to Las Vegas to try to uh, basically pull a rain man on the casinos. Then they discover the hard way that they were not the first people who have figured this out, and they're, the mob is coming after them, the magic mob. Uh, and the third one was called Carpathia. And it was about the ship that picks up the um, 
the survivors of the Titanic. The name of the ship is the Carpathia. It also happens to be the name of the mountain range in which sits Castle Dracula. So the Carpathia is full of vampires coming back to the old world and they pick up the survivors of the Titanic and it gets just bloody bad from there. So crazy. But, you know, again, if you come up with an idea for something, you can, you know, boil down to a few sentences like that, what they call a plot hook. Uh, that's a great thing to do because you can then turn around and use that to sell to your editor, your publisher, they can turn around and use it to sell to the public. Some kind of a simple idea that has lots of hooks in it where people say, oh, that sounds cool. Yeah. Next Good question stuff. is Daniel. Um, hi, <clears throat> I had a question about um, world building sure. and how um, it can like relate to plot because I was wondering how, when you're doing world building, how do you like bridge the like gap that sometimes appears between like the character like level and the world level so when you have like individual characters and stuff and then you have like the world like geography and the politics and like world uh, country borders and other things like that and how do you like bridge these two so that it doesn't feel like one is um sort of just being more controlling over the other in terms of like um how yeah I understand what you're saying. The question is, how do you make it seem that this is a natural thing and everything dovetails together nicely, as opposed to seem like they're so artificial that they're one is wagging the other, so to speak, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the way you do this, well, honestly, you're making it up as you go along. So a lot of people say, do you start out with the characters? Do you start out with the plot? Do you start out with the world? And the answer is yes, you start out with all of them, right? Yeah, a lot of times you come up with one first and then like, for instance, if you come up with the plot, like when I did with the Immortals, I'm like, okay, now I have to come up with a character that fits that. Now I have to research what I think uh, Washington, D.C. is going to look like in 50 years. I have to come up with things for that. The neat trick about this is I think, again, when I'm doing an outline, I do very slim outlines. I try not to do too much into them. When I'm doing world building, I do slim world building. I try not to do too much into it because the problem is if you get too carried away with some, if I'm doing a character profile, I try not to get too far into it. The act of creation is an act of discovery. If you get too far welded into one of those, the others will suffer for it, right? A lot of times people like, and, and sometimes it works out well. I mean, if George R. R. Martin wants to spend an entire freaking chapter detailing what you had for dinner, it obviously has worked for George Martin, right? But um, for most people, they don't want to hear what these characters had for dinner. They don't need to have the world building smacked in their face constantly. Most people only care about the parts of the characters and the parts of the world building that matter to the story that you're telling, assuming that you're telling a narrative. Now, when you're doing a background for like a Dungeons and Dragons game or something like that, you have to be more expansive with the world building because you're not coming up with characters. That's the player's job. Right. The players are coming up with the characters. You're providing opportunities for them to have adventures. So that's an entirely different type of thing. And in that case, you get to focus on all the world backgrounds. And But you, as you're doing it, you have to fill it full of hooks. It shouldn't just be like, this is it, because it can come across as dull. It can come across as like you're reading out of a CIA fact book or something about you know Missouri back in the, in the 80s. Who the hell cares, right? You need to have a reason for people to care and for them to say, oh, that's exciting. Oh, I could do something with that. Maybe I want to go in that direction. Maybe I want my character to be involved with these people. Maybe those are the bad guys, right? That's what you want to be able to do with this stuff. So you want to have all those different ways for people to hook into it one way or another. Uh, it can be very tricky to be able to pull all that off. If you're doing a traditional narrative, um, what I try to tell, the metaphor I try to tell people is if you've ever walked into a television station or a movie studio, you'll see that the stuff that's taped off will have like a frame sometimes. That is where they put every damn dollar, every bit of effort, all the money goes into what shows up on the frame, right? And what's right next to the frame, just outside of where the camera shows you is bailing wire and duct tape and everything else, right? These are the things that are implied by everything that's on the screen, but you don't actually have to see them. And if you're not gonna see them, you don't have to put that much effort into them. Try to cut down the amount of effort you put on the things that nobody is ever going to see and focus on the things that people are going to see. When you're starting out, you can you know try to spread it out as much as you can, but as it starts to come together and you start developing a direction, Focus on the things that are going to be important to the people who are using that for whatever it is. Now, that goes to another question is whether or not this is an art project or a commerce project, right? If you're doing it for arts, you can do whatever you want to. It's an art installation. You're having fun with it. Let people make of it what you will. If you're trying to do it for commerce, you have to think, how are people meant to use this? How are people meant to interact with it, right? And then that will dictate some of the ways you're going to develop the thing. I hope that hey, thank you. Great question. Uh, Yoon is next. Hi, I, I have some questions on world building too. Sure. All right. So um, I've learned that um, 
uh, writing is pretty interdisciplinary because if you want to write about like metallurgy, you're gonna have to know a little bit about it to kind of write about it um, kind of realistically. Um, but when you write fantasy, how much of it is based on stuff in real life? And um, for you, what was most useful to learn from in real life to use in your books? You know, uh, I have to tell you, the best thing for my career was actually going two years into a, into a computer science uh, electrical engineering degree because it taught me how to think like a programmer. It taught me how to code. It taught me how to think in terms of flowchart. And when you're dealing with people who do this stuff for a living, especially in video games, it's great to be able to talk with a, uh, a mutual vocabulary, right? If they want to tell me about the parameters and the different uh, decision trees and things like that, being able to have that kind of information, be able to talk to them in the language they understand and to understand the things you're telling me really does help quite a bit. Um, by way of example, I actually did something called a Star Trek utility belt that came out for the 2009 movie. And it was basically a role play kit that kids would then take. It was sold by Playmates Toys in, you know, in uh, Toys R Us and Walmart, Target, wherever else. But it was a device that had a communicator and a phaser. And these were just pieces of plastic. And then the belt, it had a uh, magnetic switch. And if you waved one of the, either the communicator or the phaser over the belt, it would make noise, right? So if you wave the phaser over the belt, it would then go pew, 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 pew. But if you wave the, wave the communicator over the belt, it would then have uh, the guy who does the voice for Starfleet Command would come on and say, Captain Kirk. And then you would, he would send you on a different missions. And be, they wanted me to write the script for this. Uh, which was tricky. I'm like, well, how much time do I have in the script? They're like, you have 90 seconds. How do you fit a story into 90 seconds? I'm like, I can't come up with a story in 90 seconds. Or if I do, what's going to happen is going to be the same damn story over and over. I'm going to want to kill my kids if they keep playing this in the backyard for 10 hours straight, or they're going to get bored of it, right? Uh, so actually what I did is I said, can I actually come up with a random adventure generator for that? And I did. And they said, sure. So they actually hired a programmer to do all an assembly on the ship there. And I came up with something where it came up with uh, eight different starting points, eight different ending points, which reach about three seconds each. And then uh, between those, it would choose three to five different mission complications from a list of 30. And they gave us something on the order of 800,000 to a million point two uh, different variations, right? Which is great. That was because I was able to learn those things before that, I was able to speak, of those, speak to people in that kind of a way. I actually got to sit in JJ Abrams' office and read the script a year before the movie came out too, which is really cool. Um, uh, does that answer your question? Not yeah, sure. it's okay. it's really interesting that computer science kind of played a part in your creative writing process. Yeah. The other thing you need to know, the other thing you need to be aware of is that, uh, well, nowadays you can learn anything you want to on Google, right? But one of the best things that my my uh, my college education taught me, I mean, you don't need a degree to go off and be a game designer or a writer or whatever, right? People do this all the time and they come from different fields. But the thing it taught me was to, it taught me how to learn. It taught me how to teach myself things I didn't know, right? So if I don't know something, I can go figure it out and teach myself to a reasonable level so I can sound like I know what the hell I'm talking about. I've actually written books about things I know squat about, right? I wrote a couple of different complete idiots guides to drawing, right? Uh, for shoujo, uh, shoujo, uh, shoujo, which is Japanese manga for girls, uh, for fantasy creatures from manga, and there was one for superheroes too. I do know superheroes, but you know, honestly, didn't know anything about shoujo before I sat down with this. And the artist didn't know how to teach somebody to draw either. I'm like, well, let's study art books and figure out how they work. You know, the how to draw books. I'm like, okay, you have to draw them in stages so people could figure. Here's how you draw a framework. Here's how you round things out. And I taught the artist how to teach people how to draw, and then wrote the script for her to figure that stuff out. Um, so you know, honestly, that's the best thing your college degree is going to teach you is to figure out how to teach yourself other stuff. Right. How to be receptive to that, what goes in your brain the best way. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Next up is Adriana again. All right. It's me again. So I, if anyone else would like to go before me, since I've already asked a question, I'm totally willing to just vibe. No, it's good. Well, if someone else wants to queue and we still have plenty of time, Adriana. Awesome. Uh, this question kind of came up when you were talking about the the projects that you haven't written <laughs> that you want to write or the ones that you currently just like have to republish and all that all that crazy difficult stuff. Um, so this is more just out of curiosity and you know I'm more familiar with academics than industry. But sure. do you do you or other writers as prolific as you ever have like a manager of sorts like in the way that an actor has an agent? 
Yeah, some do. Uh, most of those are, you know, best-selling New York Times, blah, blah, blah. I'm actually a New York Times best-selling author. I was going to say, like, you're not. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, I'm gonna do, that's because I wrote an edition of the Marvel Encyclopedia that spent six months on the New York Times bestseller list, which I'm like, you know, that's really cool. But it's really because of Marvel in a way. Although one of my friends is always kind enough to point out, he's like, you know, there are a lot of Marvel books out there, Matt, that don't make the New York Times bestseller list. So, you know, wear that with pride. So I'm don't happy about that. Don't downsell yourself. <laughs> but I didn't get a royalty on that book. So I, you know, for instance, when the guys hired me to write the uh, Marvel role-playing game, uh, John Nee, who was a publisher of Marvel at the time, uh, he says, Matt, I know you didn't get a royalty on that because if you had, you would have rolled up to this convention in a limousine. I'm like, fair point, John, make me rich. Let's see how this works. <laughs> Um, but some people do. Some people uh, like doing that. They'll do virtual assistants. I know some people do that. Some people, uh, Kevin Anderson is a pretty prolific writer. He actually writes his books by hiking in the Rockies where he lives and dictating them into a, a recorder. And he sends the recording off to a woman who transcribes his dictation for $2 a page. And then he sits down and revises that stuff and makes it into a coherent story, right? Uh, other people have people handle their... Uh, their public appearances or speakings, all that kind of stuff. Honestly, unless you're a fairly prolific and unless your books are consistently in the top bestseller list, you're probably as an author not making enough money to hire a lot of people, right? Uh, often you're, if you're talking about publicity or whatever, your publisher will handle a lot of that stuff. Uh, my problem has been a lifelong uh, inability to focus, right? So uh, because I do game design, because I write comics, because I write uh, video games, because I write novels, all that kind of stuff. I don't really sit down and do just one thing. It, the funny part is, to me, they really are all the same thing. They're really all about stories, right? I'm telling stories in different methods, and using different tools and exploring different ways. Um, so to me, they don't feel that different. But uh, but people are like, oh, if you write this, how can you possibly write that? I'm like, because really, at its heart, it's a story, right? Role-playing games are just a... a Man, it's a means of giving somebody else a, a way to tell stories, but you have to tell stories for them to be able to riff off of too. So, um, so there are some people who do that. I also tend to be very much a guy who likes to know exactly what's going on in his life at every point. Uh, when I was running Pinnacle Entertainment Group, we split the details up and I was always like, well, I don't know what's going on over there. And that always wasn't the best thing. I think, you know, knowing what's going on in your life, especially where your money is going at any point, is always a uh, pretty vital thing for you. So like I do my own taxes these days. I, you know, I invest my own money when I have money for my retirement fund, stuff like that. Um, and I basically do the research. Part of that's because I like to teach myself things and I like to know how things work in the world. And I also think that because I know those things that actually makes me a better writer and creator because then I can then think about those things in terms of world building and characters and everything else when I'm going off to do those creative things. Um, I'll let uh, anyone else, I think we have time for about one or two more questions if anyone wants to queue up, but I have a question for Matt in the meantime. All right, so Matthew will be one of the, We'll have a battle of the mats at the end of the day, <laughs> things. Um, but I, I think the big question I have um, for the room who is undoubtedly inspired right now by all these stories of like, you know, um, uh, working in the games industry or um, how, how to get involved. How do you think if, if you're starting out at square zero, oh. you've never been to a con and you don't know what to do, what would the next steps be? How do you think you should get involved? Well, you know, uh, the way I did it is not the easiest way. And it's also kind of archaic nowadays because it was 30 some years ago, right? Which I would say, go to conventions, introduce yourself, start playing games. Um, I think that's a really good way to do it still in a lot of ways because it, it gets you personal face time with people. Uh, if you want somebody to hire you for a job, honestly, one of the things that people forget about when they're doing, especially virtual work nowadays, is that interviews aren't really always about determining whether or not you have the skill set. It's often easy to find people who have the skill set that somebody needs. The trick is, can they stand you, right? Can they stand being in the same office building with you? Can they stand having to interact with you on a regular basis? Uh, and that's a lot of what an interview is, especially in smaller companies, is about whether or not you're simpatico with the person that you're going to be working with, right? Um, for whatever reason. And conventions are a great way to figure that out. You know, if you end up working a, a eight hour shift in a booth, and going out to dinner and maybe to, for drinks afterwards with somebody and saying, okay, now this is a person I know. We know we have the skills. We know we like spending time with each other. This could be a good working relationship. It's good for you too, because if you figure out the people in charge are jerks, you don't want to work for them either, right? If they don't treat you well as a booth person, uh, they're not going to treat you well as an employer or as a, as a freelancer either. 
So avoid those people. Uh, now, on the other hand, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You, you can jump straight into doing independent publishing by yourself nowadays in a way that was impossible when I was a kid. You can just pick up and go through, uh, create your own stuff, get a copy of Affinity Publishing as opposed to uh, you know the Adobe suite. Affinity does like $50 versions of publishing projects or publishing software as opposed to Adobe, which costs you, you know, 30 to 50 to whatever dollars a month. Um, you learn how to use those. You can put stuff up on drive through RPG or um, drive through fiction. You can publish through Amazon. You can do all sorts of different things. And you can get your name out there doing those things. You can do your own actual plays and put them up on YouTube. You know, whether or not anybody watches, you're learning as you go. Uh, you're, and you, have, you actually manage to catch an audience of some kind. Uh, it's fantastic. You know, just uh, take advantage of that. You're going to meet people who will reach out to you and you can do the same for them. They have similar interests with you that might think, man, you know, one of the reasons you start to create stuff is because the thing that you want doesn't exist yet, right? And if nobody else is going to make it, damn it, it's up to you to do it. So if somebody creates something and you're like, oh, that's exactly what I wanted. I just didn't get to it. I didn't realize it. You start talking to them like, oh, that me too. And maybe you guys can work together on something cool and do something even better together, right? Um, so you can't just do this stuff yourself. The trick is, of course, when you're starting out, you probably don't have all the skills that you need. You probably, you know, I was fortunate enough to work my way up as an, through editing and publishing. So I, the neat thing about that is I was able to ask a lot of questions. I had, Will Namely was one of my mentors, as I mentioned. And Will got to the point where before I would even ask him, how does that work? He'd say, you know, you always ask me how it works. So I'm just going to tell you. And he would just blurt it out right there and just run down everything. Because as, you know, we would spend a lot of time together on the road. I'd say, well, Will, tell me about this. And I would just let him ramble on things and learn, and soak it up and absorb. That's how I know how everything in the gaming industry works is because I paid attention. To it. I often tell people, if your first project, you probably want to publish it through somebody else and ask them questions and learn as, as they go. Like if they do something, go, why are you doing that? Not because you're offended or you want you're, you think they're doing it wrong. You're like, I curiously want to know, why do you do it that way, right? And once you learn all that stuff, then you can say, you can take a hard look at yourself and say, I can do that or, oh my God, I'm so happy that other person is doing that. There's two ways you can go. And then you can figure out if you wanna keep publishing with other people or if you wanna self-publish your own stuff, right? Uh, when I got out of Pinnacle Entertainment Group, uh, which I ran for four years and was the co-founder of, um, I was like, screw this, I'm never publishing again. Yeah, I'm too, I, I really like the creative stuff. I'm gonna go off and do that and let other people deal with all the other crap. Now, you know, many years later, I'm actually getting back into publishing stuff again. Uh, and I do it kind of as a sideline thing for me and my kids to have some fun with and do our own things, uh, things that I don't think anybody else is ever going to want to do or maybe wouldn't do it in the way that I want them to do. Uh, and so you can do both worlds if you want to. Figure out what works best for you and just hit at it. Ask questions too. There are a lot of uh, really supportive communities out there. There are discords and there's forums and all sorts of different things you can join where people are willing to share information. If you're interested in writing for video games, the uh, International Game Developers Association has a writer's SIG, a special interest group that I'm on the board of, uh, that you know it's free to join. You don't even have to join the IGDA to actually be a part of. They work on Facebook and um, Discord and such like that. Now, we had a mailing list where we started out, but it's kind of gone fallow these days because we do it through other things. Um, but just get your name out there and start interacting with people. My main advice to you is when you're doing it is be kind and be enthusiastic, right? Those kind of things travel. People will tell you this guy's a jerk. They'll also tell other people if you're a jerk. So, you know, try to be open and excited and enthusiastic. And if you're going to work in a field that you're like this, you should be a fan of the field because otherwise, you know, go off and do something else for a living. Why torture yourself for something like this? Um, most people in most creative fields don't make a ton of money right? I've done pretty well for myself. I actually make a decent living. And I've been doing it for decades now. But most people, you know, you end up, I always say, you know, the thing you can always identify is the guy who goes from being a garage, you know, a guy who picks up a guitar. There's a huge number of people just pick up a guitar. A smaller number of people will actually, you know, learn how to play it pretty well. A smaller number of people will join a band. A smaller number of people will actually play a gig. A smaller number of people will actually play more than one gig and then get a recording contract, then actually have it produced, then actually have it be a hit. And if you ever get to that top of the pyramid, you're doing amazing, but there's lots of other people who are doing it throughout the way there. You may stall out at any point in that. You may go all the way to the top. You may bump up and down as you go. But it's kind of this pyramid of people that works its way up and just enjoy the, every step of that. For me, a lot of the times, uh, if, I, if I thought it was going to be externally validating, that was going to be crushing to me, right? If I needed to have good reviews or tons of money or anything else, 
I actually enjoy the process of putting things together for stories. I enjoy making stories. I enjoy taking paragraphs and moving the words around and making make lots of sense. I enjoy designing games. That's the fun. Some people want to be, they want to have published more, or they want to have written more than they actually have, want to write. It helps if you want to write, if you want to create, as opposed to having that behind you so you can get on to the, what you think of the fun stuff is. You know, the glamour thing where you're signing autographs and people are lauding you and you're walking red carpets and all that crap. Enjoy the work. The rest of that stuff just smells and whistles. All right, and we have a minute left, so I'll let Matt ask his, Matthew ask his question to Matt very quickly. All right, so with all the games that you've made, um, do you ever avoid them? Like, do you ever avoid playing them? Is there a separation between your work life and your, uh, like, fun life? Like, I know yeah, you say that you, like, I know you were saying you work on vacations. But like, do you ever play a game of D and D and then DM and then get ideas for something else you're working on, or do you like stay away from DMing because like, oh, I need a break from world day living. I'm just gonna be a player for a bit. That is one of the problems of becoming a creative professional is that the it then is your job. Right. So that's not what you do for a break a lot of the time. Some people I know do it and they manage it. I try to keep healthy, which means I don't. Right. Uh, I don't even go back to my own games after I'm done with them a lot of time, unless I'm working on a line of games and I need to know exactly what's going on. Once I'm done with it, I'm done with it. I moved on to the next thing. By the time one of my products has actually hit the market, I've probably worked on two or three other things in the meantime, maybe more. Right. Sometimes it's a dozen. Um, so the funny part is that people who play the game in the first month that it's out will know the game better than I do at that point, because I will have forgotten most of it. Uh, but it's, you know, that's not because um, I'm not interested. It's because it's my job. I've done my job. Now I'm moving on to the next thing, which is also really goddamn cool. And I want to do that. Uh, but to linger on that thing I did before is not really productive for me, right? Now, on the other hand, you know, when I started out as an editor, uh, it took me a while to then learn how to read for fun again after I quit being an editor. Because if you're an editor, you have to read every line, every word, every paragraph, and then you have to think about it holistically, how it all hangs together. Um, and it destroys your ability to read quickly and just for fun. But once you put that aside, once I put that aside, I was able to finally get back. I'm like, oh, now I can read a book a day again. This is freaking great. Uh, but, you know, I go through streaks. Like after I wrote the Marvel Encyclopedia, both times I did it, I read so many comics, I couldn't even tell you. And then I would not read a comic book for a year after I was done. Just because I was like, oh, that's enough. I'm full. Oh, geez, that was plenty. Um, but when, you know, somebody says, would you like to work on the Marvel role-playing game or the next edition of this? I'm like, yes. And I dive right back in and it's just as much fun as it was before. Um, I'm kind of like a goldfish in that way. If you've seen Ted Lasso, you just remember, you, you remember the thing just happened. Nah, forget it. Move on. Okay. Oh, ooh, that cool thing is still cool again. It's a, kind of my superpowers to not get too dragged down on stuff like that. It really has worked well for me over the years. The other thing is, you know, if you're working on something you've never heard of before, uh, like I did a Monster Rancher collectible card game based on the TV show and uh, PS1 game many years ago. And I had never even heard any of this stuff. But after watching 26 episodes of a cartoon and playing the death of the PS1 game, I was a super fan and then able to do it, right? And I haven't touched the thing since. I'm like, oh, that was fun. Now to the next thing, you know? And sometimes people go up and say, oh, that was the best thing you ever did. I'm like, oh, great. I don't remember anything about it, but thank you. So. It's all good fun. Well, I think I speak on the behalf of the class when I say this was wonderful, Matt. Um, uh, one last question um, is, is there a way that everybody can get in contact with you if they sure. would like? Yeah, if anybody has any kind of questions, any advice or anything like that, you can reach me at Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, at Forbeck, F-O-R-B-E-C-K dot com. My email is out there. It's on my website and all that. Anyway, you can find it. Uh, Forbeck dot com is my website. You can go there. It's got it's not always up to date. My blog is kind of laid fallow, but I try to put up new things for everything that's coming out new. And I've done that for about 10 or 15 years. So it's got, you know, most of the last decade or so stuff I've done. Um, you can find me on Twitter at M Forbeck, where I'm on there because I'm bored sometimes. And, uh, you know, if I get stuck for a second, I'm like, oh, let's go to Twitter. Oh, I'll play Wordle. Oh, I got the idea now. I'm good. So you can find me there and also on Facebook too. And all Instagram right, and all the other crap. So, there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. Um, let's all give Matt a huge round of applause. Thank you, guys. It's um, honestly a pleasure to do this stuff. I hope to be playing your stuff and reading your stuff in years to come. So good luck to you all.